Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Dror Tirosh. We work at the, on the OpenGSN gas station network, but recently we're working with uh, Yoav Weiss, which was supposed to pass this presentation, but he's sick in the hotel, so we are covering him up. We'll talk about account abstraction and uh, what can be done with it. First, uh, what is account abstraction? But before we talk what is account abstraction, what is an account? On Ethereum, account comes in uh, two flavors. One of them is externally owned account that we all know, and the other are contract-based accounts. And if you have a wallet, you're probably using an EOA account. EOA accounts are very easy to start to work with, but they have quite a few uh, limitations. First of all, key management is very, very problematic. The private key is tightly coupled with the address, which means you can't change it. You have to keep it secret. Because if you lose it, you lose everything. But uh, if you make copies in order not to lose it, someone can find it. And then he will get everything and you will lose everything. So key management is hard. Uh, there's also there's one, one fits all access control. You can do everything. It might be good for you, for personal uh, usage, that you can do everything. But it is very, very limiting if uh, you know, away, uh, all these operations. By abstracting them away, we mean it is not the node uh, that performed the operation that checks the signature, that checks the, the security of the node, checks the balance, performed the uh, payment, but we abstract it away and make a contract, the wallet contract being responsible for all of these. So the key management becomes simpler because the wallet can do a key management by itself. Uh, access control mechanism, if we want, the gas payment he does. Uh, I mean, a lot, a, lot, a lot of things become easier, but just the easiest way to think about this is making contracts, wallet contracts, first-class citizens. They're no longer second-class citizens of Ethereum, and that you don't need an EOA in order to operate your contract wallet, right? You can start from a contract wallet, and you'll never need to have an EOA. Okay. From now, when we're talking about account abstraction, now we're talking what can be done with it. Now, with the next slide, with all the features, none of them are implemented by us. They are about to be implemented by you. We only open the door with accounts in order to be able to add all these cool features. So, the first use case is recovery. Right now, the recovery sucks. You can't recover. You. Private key, you can't really recover it. You have to save this private key somewhere as uh, multiple uh, funny words or otherwise. Uh, with account abstraction, you can implement into your wallet social recovery or other recovery mechanism. Uh, you can add a dead man switch, like if I'm unfortunately, or someone is about died and you don't want to lose all the, the assets he has, it can set a dead man switch that is after a period of time that he's not using the account, someone else uh, will inherit this account. This like, like a multi-sig that your family controls, but it only becomes active a year after yeah. Your, you know, your, your key is, is not active. Yes, we're talking about a recovery, but multi-sig, of course, when you're talking about uh, signature cases, multi-sig is uh, uh, something that we see, we, we want to have for accounts. Another option is per device keys. You might want your phone. Your phone is a very strong hardware to protect keys. So it might be very easy that, you know, the protection of your phone, whether it's fingerprint or whatever, or other biometric check, this is the way to uh, control your account. And if you lose this device, yes, we have recovery. I will, use another, uh, I will assign another device as my uh, uh, wallet uh, signer. Uh, these are pair device keys. Uh, there are other signature scheme you can use. BLS signature is a very, has a very cool feature which can be compressed very nicely and which reduce gas on uh, L2 networks. So. It's an extension that can be added on top of account abstraction on those networks to reduce uh, the gas fees. Uh, and if you are looking into the future, we know that ECDSA signatures sometime in the future will become weaker. That is, the attack will become stronger. And uh, with the quantum machines, eventually, within 5, 10, or 20 years, they will be uh, able to be uh, cracked. We want to be able to upgrade our accounts, at least our important ones, 
before them. Uh, so quantum, re quantum resistant uh, signatures might be a way. And again, each of those cool features we are talking is not a systematic change of all accounts. Is a specific account want to experiment or want to add a feature? Okay, you upgrade your account and now you have those features, like any of those on the slides around. Uh, sorry. Did miss anyone? Okay, now we're talking about uh, some roles. You know, you have, right now, as I said, with EOAs, you have a signature and you can do everything. When you use smart account, you can put roles. You can allow different roles to do different things. Maybe on your home, on your personal account, you want to do the master to do it all. But if it's a corporate account, you might say that you want the legal department to be able to vote but not move tokens. You want an auditor to be able to cancel pending events but not generate events. Is set to a, I don't know, set to a payroll system to be able to submit to known addresses. Again, the sky's the limit, what you can do, and it is still, you can add it to this uh, account. Wait, maybe a little bit about session keys? Or? Ah, sorry. Uh, okay, we talked about the, the high end of uh, accounts, that is accounts, corporate account. There is also the lower end, you know, you have your personal account, but you also want to play games. With games, even the single accept per request might be annoying. You don't want to accept each operation. So for games, you might assign your uh, account a session key. This key is allowed to make transaction for specific targets, specific game. And now you are wallet free, you free the UX from accepting each transaction and you know it is limited, it's only this game. So it can be your own wallet, but you didn't sacrifice for this game your entire security. Is this the next? Yes, okay, we talked about the security, about the role access. Now let's talk about the gas, gas abstraction. With normal accounts, uh, the account has to have ETH in order to pay for the transaction. With account abstraction, we want to abstract away the gas. We want to be able for a third party to pay for a transaction, which is very, very uh, good for onboarding, like a DAP want to pay for transaction for his deployment of its client uh, or client that uses its own account. If you have a token, it might be useful to use your own token your, for the, so the user will be able to pay with uh, your DAP's token for transactions and for traders, if a trader want to trade on Uniswap with a DAI, why should he have ETH to pay for gas? He has DAI, why not pay with that? So paying with token is a cool use case that uh, we really want to have uh, in, in uh, the system. Uh, privacy, if uh, you think about it, if you go and you want to protect your privacy and use uh, a mixer like Tornado Cash or other, and Yes, you put the money in, now you want to get the money out, but you have to have gas in order to withdraw this uh, amount. How did you get that gas? From some KYC account. So you're not really anonymous. When you withdraw funds from a, a mixer, you are not anonymous, even though you would like to be. So if you're using a, a account absorption model, you can uh, use part of the uh, amount that you withdraw from the mixer as a gas payment. So this way you can withdraw an, f completely anonymous from a mixer. Well, one thing quick to add is the gas sponsorship model is very flexible. Um, Dole gave an example of onboarding where you're subsidizing the fee entirely, but you can have arbitrary logic. It's implemented by a contract. You can limit that in any way you want. You can subsidize if you want only some transactions. Um, you can make a users authenticate in some way. Uh, you can decide only to subsidize um, uh, governance actions. I mean, it's arbitrary logic, so anything you want, you can do with this. It's just you decide uh, what the conditions are, including asking for re repayment in another token. As I said, all of these are features that you have to implement. We implement the infrastructure. <laughs> I'm only suggesting. A cross-chain operation, a since we are abstracting gas, you have a contract. You have a contract that can pay for its own deployment and you have a mechanism that can pay for uh, 
the deployment and for execution transactions, the next thing to think about is that I want to make operation on multiple networks. I am on first network, I can pay on there, but I want to use my account on other networks. And so it is possible to create a paymaster mechanism, a, a payment mechanism, that I will be able to perform that operation on those uh, other network. It uses my signature. I approve these transactions. So it's not some other party acting on my behalf. It's me acting on those networks, but I don't have any balance on it. I don't have to have any ETH balance or native ba token balance on those networks. It's a system that can uh, move the payment between uh, the networks. Keeping moving back. And uh, lastly, uh, we have a wallet. So there's a link for the, for the entire presentation, all the, everything at the end. Uh, as we said with the uh, EOA accounts, I'm limited for performing a single operation at a time, which cannot be batched and, cannot, and requires an acceptance on each operation. It's very easy to add to a, a wallet account performing a batch and uh, doing atomically a sequence of operation. Uh, another use case we can see is that you want a atomic operation or a delayed operation that is, I create an operation and I want it to be executed later. A service can do it. And again, it is my account that performs this operation because I gave some service uh, the rights to do it at a later time. Uh, Okay, these are all cool ideas. Some of them are very old. Some of them. And regarding just the event-driven flows, because they're very interesting, um, maybe a couple of examples. One, let's say there's an NFT that mints at a certain time, then you don't have to wait in front of your computer, and then you just, just like create the transaction. Then you could pre-register the transaction into, into a, um, like a registry contract of pending transactions, and then searchers, you provide them an incentive to um, execute the transaction when the time comes and they're competing with each other. Another use case would be, let's say you want to perform some trade in the future pending on certain conditions, price, um, you know, whatever, whatever you want. Um, so all this becomes possible and it doesn't require any trust. Uh, why do I keep sending it back? Okay, with the... ERC 4337, uh, we wanted to create an implementation uh, of account abstraction that can be uh, executed today. Not something we have to change the protocol, but something we can add today. So we define a mempool of uh, what we call a user operation. User operation is a transaction in our terminology. So just like the normal user uh, mempool of transaction, there is the mempool of user operation that nodes can uh, withdraw transactions from. They collect them and is to send a, a, to batch them and send them on the network. Uh, but the, the, okay. the key thing about, about this separate mempool, it's not a private mempool like Flashbots, it's just separate because it's accepting this, this user operation. Um, instead of a regular transaction. But the key thing um, that's different about this is just it doesn't require you to have like an EOA to interact. It doesn't require you to have the ETH um, to pay for it because what you're doing is you're specifying within the user operation the conditions that will make it worthwhile for bundlers to uh, submit your transaction on chain. Um, and they, they, they make sure they get like refunded for gas. Um, so it works out. Okay, so our implementation, what it does, it, it takes, as I said, these user operations. Uh, they no, you no longer need an EOA to send this user operation. The nodes themselves take the user operation, collect them into batches and uh, put them uh, on-chain, perform the validation. That is, validation is the signature, nonce, and the payment. And then perform the execution that uh, uh, you want to make. Uh, if you read the AP, most of the AP is not about usability, about how wallets work, but how we protect this, the network. It is very important that those uh, nodes that handle operations, like when they handle transactions, 
are not uh, susceptible to denial of service attacks. So we had a lot of mechanism to make sure that they cannot be attacked. So we batch them together so that they will be cheaper and uh, sending them uh, on chain. It is, since it is contract based, it can work on any EVM based network uh, today. Uh, what, where would you see, where would you we want to take it uh, to the next level? Right now, when you create a, an, an account abstracted wallet, it, we want to make it a first class citizen on the network, a first class uh, account on the network. Right now it isn't. It is second class because there are some differences between uh, UA accounts and some applications require UA accounts in the way they work, in the way they require signature. Think of permit. You cannot do permit directly with a, a wallet account. We do want to make them first class uh, uh, citizens. So the next stage after uh, what we have done today, which is having a contract based mechanism to, uh, to deploy them on chain, we want to add them into the network to what we call enshrine 4337 into the network so that account abstracted account will be accounts and transaction in the system just like normal accounts. And then to make it possible to convert any EOA account into a smart, uh, into account abstracted. That is, there's going to be a way, it is not fully uh, hashed yet, mm -hmm. it will take some time until we finish it and mm -hmm. until it will be approved into the network. Mm -hmm. But uh, there's going to be a way that you have a normal account mm -hmm. and you want to have uh, those uh, extra features, mm -hmm. uh, so you will be able to uh, enable this account there are several ways how to do it. One of them is that you will actively have to convert your uh, account, your account into a smart account, abstracted account. The other way is that there's going to be some point of in time where all EOA accounts will become uh, abstracted, but with a default implementation that emulates completely the normal EOA account. And from that point, you can, yes, you can keep the same implementation or you can... Uh, switch to a different implementation if you want uh, extra features like all of those that uh, we described earlier. So one, one, um, um, one thing to maybe refine a little bit is um, we believe EOAs will need to go away at some point. Um, so right now they are enshrined into the protocol um, and we've discussed some of the limitations around that. So at some point EOAs, even if there's backwards compatibility, they will, they will not be a part of the protocol anymore. Um, we don't necessarily think that it makes sense to enshrine any specific alternative. Like, you know, this is an ERC, maybe there will be like, you know, improvements in the future because that could be dangerous. But what's clear is abstract accounts are going to be enshrined into the protocol. There are going to be, there are going to be accounts that can do all of the things that we discussed out of the box. Uh, for new deployments and for older deployments, so otherwise you would need to transfer all your assets from one EOA to another, and that's very expensive and cumbersome and, you know, potentially risky. So that's where we're headed. And in terms of the implementation, yeah, like Dole said, there are various ways of going about it um, to be determined. Okay, what can we do? Uh, you can start experimenting with uh, ERC-4337 uh, now. I see people who experimented here in the hackathon. Uh, yes, over there also. Uh, you can uh, add useful features to your accounts, innovate, do whatever you like. And uh, if you find something that you think uh, is good for the public, you can apply for an EF grant. And, uh, What, uh, and, and if you're building a DAP, uh, as we said, accounts, wallet accounts are a bit different from uh, EOA accounts. So even today when you're working with DAPs, this is not strictly related to account abstraction, but to wallet account in general. Make sure that you are not uh, forcing the user to use uh, accounts. Like if you are checking signatures, there is an extension, the 1271, that allows a wallet account to check a signature. because it, it doesn't have a signature by itself. Uh, when we say so, wallet account, just to be clear, we're talking about contract wallets. Yes. Yeah. 
Uh, if you have a token and you want to have permit, be aware that permit, as it is today in USDT and DAI, does not support a wallet account. You cannot use it from a wallet account. But again, because it uses the signature. There are some other tweaks, like TX origin and stuff. Again, in general, try to be supportive for wallet accounts because these are the future. <laughs> Not only the Gnosis safe today, but also account abstracted in the future. Uh, also, if you're using gas sponsorship models, you should also think about it, how to interact. This probably will need an interaction between the application and the wallet in order to provide the UX, how to provide this uh, to your users. And, and the last item would be regarding uh, wallets. If you're developing dApps, then maybe um, there's some space. If you, you find that wallets are not supportive enough of uh, contract wallets, then you can voice your concerns and uh, try to lobby for that as a, as a dApp developer. That, that really helps. Um, so, you know, getting everyone on board is, is, a, is a process that um, we could use your help on. Okay. Uh, okay, it is before the last. The QR code is missing here. <laughs> so if you want the link to all this, I can give you it, but uh, it doesn't appear on this version of uh, the presentation. Uh, any question? Yes? So I have like two questions, like one uh, related to how uh, currently like account abstraction exists as of today as an implementation. Can you provide an example like how like it can be potentially used in a way uh, as it is in present form? And the second question is related to the next step. Like they're like uh, curious about like smart contracts containing code, then like is there a distinction between operation that involve uh, uh, the smart wallet calling its own code versus uh, calling uh, the code uh, from a different contract? Is it like uh, own code becomes uh, like a proxy for uh, other contract call while interacting with other uh, contracts in that ecosystem? Okay. Okay, uh, for the first question, how to add it? Uh, account abstraction is an interface that, uh, or basic implementation, that we have in our uh, source code that your wallet need to inherit, provide a method or two, and then the uh, contract wallet supports account abstraction. There's also a sample how we add on top of existing uh, Gnosis safe without touching the code, adding a module to make it account abstracted uh, enabled. Uh, you do need a wallet application or browser extension that will be able to use it. We have the basic SDK how to write it. There are several wallets uh, Soul Wallet uh, described uh, behind, uh, behind you, uh, demonstrated in the hackathon, and also uh, Proton Wallet, a hackathon project uh, that try to use. There are no uh, implementation in existing wallet, like MetaMask doesn't support it right, cur currently. You have to use some other wallets, but this is now in the work. There are several wallets that are adding uh, account abstraction support. Regarding how the call is done, this is the basic solidity. It's a, a wallet is a contract, when, uh, when someone makes a call, it validates it is allowed to make this call. That is either the owner or through account abstraction a, a validation method. And then it makes a call outside. So anyone, any other contract sees this contract as the account that makes the operation, like if, whether it's a token transfer or voting or whatever. We have another question. Yes. So regarding smart contract wallets, um, so can you, can you comment on the situation on when you need to use L2 solutions? Because in most of the cases, you, you cannot because you have a smart contract wallet deployed on mainnet and you cannot deploy it on the same, on, this, uh, um, on, on every L2 like Arbitrum or Optimus. Because it, you know, it's, it's uh, for targets. instance, sorry. It will become a different address, that's what you mean? So, so you you will need to reproduce the exact the exact deployment to get the same address in order to do things like claim exactly. airdrops. Of course, yes. The short answer: yes, we built it in a way that it will create the same address, so you can have the same address on multiple networks. 
Yes, as a wallet developer, it requires some work from you in order to, for that to be possible. But it is not that difficult, and it, it can be done. Even, even the minimal, uh, the, the minimal uh, implementation of that is happening when you just funding your wallet the first time. Think of it. You open your wallet software. You see the address. It is not deployed anywhere. You see my, your address. You go to index and you move ETH or whatever into it. And then you make a transaction with that wallet. If you think of it, this wallet contract will uh, pay for its own deployment and then execute. Yes, that's how a account abstraction implementation works today. Thank you. So it works. Any more questions? Hey, thanks. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I guess we all agree about like the importance of account abstraction. And this is what Luxo was working on, like starting from 2018 and like starting with ERC 725 standard. But, and I was checking the, this ERC like way before and like I couldn't understand because it was way like too complicated. But I have just two questions. Like, can you explain more about like how users can choose the implementation and about like the cross chain execution? And just an open question, maybe we can discuss that later. Like, don't you think that the standardization of the account, like the account, need more standardization of other stuff? Like, I will give you an example. If you have a, like a, your account needs to receive token, it needs to implement on ERC721 received, on ERC1155 received, and token received for ERC223. But like, what if we come up with a new standard in the future? Like on, we need on ERC 6700, maybe, and like, maybe also we need something related to followers or like, I don't know why, because now it's related to token. Now the hype is token. Maybe in the future it's not. We can discuss that later okay. if you want. I'll try from the beginning. Yes, there were wallet accounts before account abstraction. They exist from the beginning of uh, Ethereum, which is not far away, but they exist. Uh, we didn't invent the wheel. We created a standard which allows the framework, which allowed nodes to support such accounts, accounts to be able to behave as close as possible to EOA accounts, like pay for the own deployments, mm. which is, it's, it's a bit tricky. It's possible. We, we didn't, again, we didn't invent the wheel. Creative was there. We did standardize on a way to perform uh, to separate validation from execution in order to that, uh, in order that uh, validators, what we call bundlers, can be uh, self-sustained and can be uh, DOS protected. Yes, the AIP is complex, but most of this com complexity comes from these protection mechanisms. If uh, we should rewrite it in a way that is more uh, account friendly, because most people don't implement a bundler they want to implement an account, so they need to know what they have to do. Maybe some of the limitations they have on what they do, and they don't care about the low-level implementation. Yes, uh, editorial work is required for this uh, spec. I agree. And uh, cross-chain execution. A cross-chain execution. Let's take it off-chain. Again, nothing of it is in the core of the EIP. Like BLS, there's no BLS in the core. What there is in the core, for example, is the ability to do signature aggregation, that you check the aggregation in one place for entire batch. This is in the core. BLS is merely an implementation of that. We inherit several interfaces, you add another contract to perform it, but it's separate from the core. So it is modular. All the feature, like specific feature of wallets, you suggested some callback that exists today and maybe a callback that will exist in the future, the wallets will have to implement them. Right now, your EOA doesn't support them anyway. Uh, the idea is that when you deploy uh, an account abstracted contract, I'm not think it's even written in the spec, but we expect it to be an upgradable proxy mm -hmm. that the owner can upgrade. And if it is an upgradable proxy, the, we have a basic implementation, and then the owner can change it. Don't, don't you think we're sacrificing security if like, we're going with upgradable? What you do need to do is to make sure that on your first upgrade, you upgrade it in a way that now you add security. For example, after the first upgrade, you can only 
specific mechanism will be able to upgrade. It, it, okay, account abstraction can be abused. It is, I will not prevent you from creating an insecure wallet. I think you can create a secure wallet with it. <laughs> Thank you. Yoav is, Yoav is uh, watching us um, <laughs> and sending us, uh, sending us messages, trying to participate in the question and answer session. Yoav just said, hey, like, uh, what happens post-validation is not part of the standard. It's not part of ERC-4337. And anything, anything can happen. Um, we can talk about ideas on how to make it happen, but it's not specifically related to, to the standard that we're working on right now. It's kind of, uh, you know, outside of the core. Because we want to make the core as general purpose as possible. Because maybe we don't have all the best ideas yet. And by the way, if you think there is a security breach and something we can add to this uh, definition, I'll be glad to talk and we'll be glad to edit. We are over time, however, this is a break time. So if you guys have lots of questions, we're happy to yield them. If you guys are happy to have more questions. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Anyone else? So how can you make sure that, um, you know, a wallet, uh, um, a smart contract wallet will be able to Proof that is, for example, only controlled by one individual versus multi-sig, such that the receiving contract can make a judgment call on whether it should reject or accept that call, right? So, for example, if if I no, if I have right, we so have if, we have a separation. Okay, the model we have is like this: a smart contract has a separation between validation and execution. Execution is anything it calls out. You know, you execute external contract, whether it's a token or another. Validation gets the user operation and validates whatever it likes. The minimum is validate the signature and validate the nonce, that it's not a replay and it's a valid signer. But it can do more. It can check the actual executed method and uh, say, uh, okay, I restrict access to this destination, or if it's a complex rule, I restrict access to this destination for this signer because I have multiple signers and each one has a different role and is allowed only specific method. The target contract, like a token, USDC token, USDC token doesn't receive all this information. USDC receives transfer from a sender and it will accept it. It is the wallet logic, the, the logic inside the wallet within its validation, whether to allow or disallow specific, uh, the, the operation we are now trying to make. Did I make myself clear? I'm not sure. Yes, yeah, it is complex. Yes, if, you're, if, you're, if your target smart contract does not have, you know, um, additional computational uh, things going on that, that require it to, for example, if, so if, take royalties, for example, right? If I, if I have, if I'm, if I can, I can circumvent royalty payments if I transfer an asset from, 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 a, from Alice to Bob, Right, uh, um, and and right now, if I with an EOA, I actually have to transfer the the, the private key to circumvent the the the, uh, the royalty payment. If I allow a smart contract doing that, I can change ownership of that of that of that of that. No, smart because the, the owner of the tokens is the smart contract. Yeah, I understand. But the point is, if I can transfer the ownership of the wallet address. From A to from Alice to to you to can Bob. transfer. Yeah, yeah, you yeah, yeah that's that. exactly the problem. So it's like it's like it's, that is exactly the problem. If you're in a royalty situation, that cannot be. So if you, you want a wallet, otherwise, just a second. Other, otherwise, if you're you want, circumventing royalty payments. If you want a wallet, you're doing no, no. something illegal. I'm not saying it is. I'm not saying that we support it. I'm saying that a contract may support it. For example, if you want a soul-bound wallet that you can't transfer the owner at all. Go ahead, create such a wallet. If you want a wallet that doesn't support set implementation, then create a wallet that will refuse to change implementation. When you fix, you reach that implementation, you don't allow to change. You can create such an implementation. We don't block such an implementation, right. but we support others. Understood. It's just, is, is there, is there any the standard a way to, to communicate what type of wallet implementation it is, such that the, the targeting contract can can check whether because you you don't know right it's like it's like it's like whether the, the targeting contract needs to know the context of the wallet um, implementation to make a judgment call about the owner okay first of all target contracts out there in the wild don't know anything about the caller except that it is a message sender they can check the code if they like but 
you are talking about the use cases that don't exist with EOAs, so they really new also for us, uh, smart contract calls for any operation you're talking about. The other thing, you talk about standardization, how to know. Uh, yes, it is required. We are providing right now the infrastructure for account abstractions for wallets to be built about uh, on top of it. Standardization between the account contracts and, for example, the wallet application that use them is something that the, the ecosystem will benefit, but it doesn't exist yet because neither the wallet nor the, <laughs> nor the contracts exist today. So usually it will be a siloed, like a given application with a given, uh, a, a given wallet contract with a uh, given uh, SD, uh, UR, UX for it. But we want, we, we, we will try to push and try to find innovations uh, from, the, from the community to support such integration and such uh, APIs. Well, Your scenarios are interesting, but I don't think they exist at all in the Ethereum well, ecosystem, the, not the related short, to account The short answer is an NFT can just check the code of the caller. And if they want to restrict uh, you know, themselves to primitive wallets, they can certainly do that. It was, it will, this, all of this will happen on a layer above what we're doing. Did you all have some questions that he wanted? <laughs> no, he wanted to put answers. He wanted to present his I'm, I'm a proxy for you all right now. Are you guys okay for a couple more? Or Okay. I'm coming. Oh, hi. Uh, thanks for the talk. I believe you're also an author of EIP 2771. Uh, is that right? Uh, yes. Okay. This, this is the basis of uh, meta transactions and uh, with OpenGSN. Yes, so I yes, was curious. Yeah, I was just curious uh, what you see the role that role of EIP two seven seven one having in an account abstraction world, and also for those who it don't hasn't. know it, uh, just explain it a little. Yeah, it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't. It's just not needed because it's not needed anymore. OpenGSN tried to do a gas abstraction, which we later implemented into account abstraction uh, for existing EOA accounts. And the requirement of the gas stash network, a network of relayers, which are the actual senders of transactions, meant that the target contract, being token or other, couldn't tell the real sender. So we, they had to be modified, support EIP 2771, add the method so that they can tell the real sender, which is a pain. It, it, it caused a... Adaptation of this requires the target contract to uh, be changed, doesn't support existing uh, tokens, for example. If you want your token to be meta transaction enabled, you have to rewrite it. So yes, it was problematic. Uh, it was good for dApps to add support for existing users to uh, sponsor the, the gas. Account abstractions uh, has a much uh, higher goals to replace the accounts, and it supports almost all existing contracts. As I said, with the limitation of contracts that limit themselves to EOAs, it supports any uh, contracts on the chain, all tokens, for example. So uh, yes, with the limitation, you need to add support for some tokens in your account. That's right. I agree. Uh, so the target here is not helping a dApp building uh, subsidizing the gas with account abstraction, though you can do it. The target is letting the user have control of his own account and do it in a better way. Thank you, Jor. Do you have another one? one, one I mean, last one, maybe? <laughs> Thanks. Um, so I haven't looked at 4337, so it might be like a basic question, but um, how does like ownership of the account work, like the abstracted account? Is it, is it private key held, so it's kind of like an externally owned smart contract account? Um, is it single owner? Is it multi owner? Uh, and the other question I have is Is this like a complementary standard to auth and auth call? Or is this like how would that work with, with when auth call is implemented? Okay, the answer for the question, uh, first question is all of the above or any of them because each wallet can decide. As I said, we had a wallet here in, that demonstrates how to use zero knowledge proof instead of signatures. Another wallet that implements uh, RSA signatures from your phone. You want EOA? Yes, our simple implementation uses an EOA as an owner, but it's just one implementation. The other question regarding uh, auth and auth call, uh, it is possible to do some of the features with auth and auth call. They basically do the uh, abstracting pay payment. Uh, we believe that uh, it is far too complex uh, feature just 
to justify uh, these two opcodes because they don't do anything else of the account abstraction. They don't change. They enshrine uh, the ECDSA, for example. So they can be combined, they can be used together, but uh, we hope for other alternatives. A huge round of applause for Siri and Dror. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much.